Welcome back. Keenan Singleton joined by our WCPO High School Insider Mike Dyer here and the Commissioner of the OHSAA, Dr. Dan Ross. The Commissioner since 2004, correct Commissioner? That is correct. Time has been flying by, I'm sure. Keenan, it's gone very quickly. <laughs> All right, let's jump into this. The OHSAA recently announced a tentative timeline for the next enrollment cycle and divisional alignments with competitive balance data. Now, how pleased were you with the collection from rosters from this past fall sports season and the start of this enrollment cycle this time around? Well, the fall cycle is 100%, so that part is good. Right. Uh, we're not quite at 100%, but we, we are probably down within 20 for the winter rosters. Uh, the EMIS number, which for those that are in the schools, they understand that well, that's the number that gives their base enrollment, 9, 10, 11, that you use as the starting point for all this. We uh, many times don't get that till March or April. We've already got it. We've already turned it back to the schools so that they can appeal the number to make sure that the number we have is the same one that they sent in. And so what we will then do is when we get those numbers back and we're assured that they're, they're okay, then we'll probably do some trial runs, which I think you probably saw in the timeline. Yeah, uh, so the, the board of directors will be asked to approve the base enrollment data by March 24th and possibly have the adjusted enrollment counts and divisional breakdowns in football, soccer, and volleyball by April 6th. Now, how do you plan to publish the adjusted enrollment counts to the OHSAA site, and will it be made available for the public to view? Well, the anything that doesn't have kid date on it then is going to be public pieces that they get have the opportunity to view and it will be put up on the website one of the things that we have to make sure that we work through is that when we get all the appeals back that the schools are comfortable with that so when you look at the the March data of saying okay we'll be ready to go with that uh, we have to make sure that we got the appeals but that's the, the date that we're shooting for uh, and when the the board does approve that and we get through that uh, dry run then uh, we hopefully will get those pieces put up on the website and, and, and start rolling. For us, it'll give us then the opportunity too to look at uh, where you make your cut lines in your divisions and, and, and how all that is going to work. So we would rather make sure we do it right. And, and it may so it may be in that it, that timelines in a ballpark. We would make sure that it's right versus put it out and then all of a sudden you have some that you have to move around and then. When you do that, it's a domino effect all, th all the way through all the other divisions. Accuracy over speed, obviously. Absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Ross, I know this measure was passed in May of 2014. Um, we've had a lot of years to uh, digest everything, discuss it, debate it. Um, I'm just curious, does another state have a similar setup as Ohio? No, no. Okay. And uh, when we would meet in this, as you're, it, it passed in February of 14, uh, or in spring of 14, mm -hmm. And we probably at that point in time been working on this for seven, eight years, of which uh, when it finally passed, it was the fourth effort. But every one of those efforts were very close. They were within 25 or 30 votes and out of 800 some schools, you know that you're close. You know, you may, you may not have just hit the tipping point, but you know that you're really, really close with that. But uh, it, it took a long time for the for all of it to come together. We got a lot of input from a lot of people over that point in time, and uh, we felt really, really confident with what we came up with. How, how much of an adjustment will you, you think we'll see in the numbers when everything is released? Well, I think that uh, one of the things that we think that we, where we'll see the, uh, the biggest adjustment is going to be for probably for three, three different categories. One, if you get your kids from outside, and most of them are coming from the outside, there's probably going to be an adjustment with that. The second one is if you're in the bottom of a tier, because the, the, you may have the ones that are going to come up, mm -hmm. and if you're in the top of the tier, you may have some that, that may push you down. So it's probably, I would say if you're in the bottom of your division currently now, you'd have to lot, have a lot of kids come in to push you up to the next division. But if you're in that top quartile, uh, and you get some kids, kids uh, most of your kids are coming from outside your district uh, or outside your feeder system, you probably would have a better normal chance to, to move up. There's been a lot of discussion about the multiplier. Um, I'm just curious, is there a good indicator that the OHSA is looking at to, to know that the multiplier is actually the correct number for the foreseeable future? Well, the, the multipliers that were put in place were put in place, uh, uh, most of the team sports are five. 
soccer has the fewest number of divisions of all of those, so that's why it's a little bit higher because Six, you, cause right. the size of your division is a lot larger. Sure. And football was smaller because the size of their divisions are smaller. And so they were put in place to, with that piece put in mind, but I don't think that anybody believes that they're perfect. I don't think anybody believes that the system is perfect. But you almost have to go through the cycle and see how it does. Does it make the kind of movement that, that you need to have? Uh, I think most of our ADs and most of our schools would tell you that uh, they're tickled to death, that something's being done, uh, and they don't expect it to be perfect, but they expect that the, the association and the board and their representatives with their coaches association would share things that they believe would make it better. Because one of the things that we've absolutely uh, received commitment from the board is that when we receive those pieces, we take them under consideration for the next cycle. So what we're going through is probably going to last two years. And then, uh, so during that two years, you're going to be putting together all of those tweaks and all those suggestions. The committee is still together. We met a, about a, six weeks ago. And uh, just to make sure we answer questions about things that have come up since it passed. And so uh, we feel really, really fortunate that we're, we feel like we're on the right st uh, step. We're made the right steps. We're in the, the, going in the right direction. But we also know that we have a long way to go. It's a journey and it won't be perfect. Obviously, we're in a tri-state area here in Cincinnati. Uh, Indiana has a success factor as part of their level in the playing field, as it were. Um, what, are, what are some of the you know, different feedback items that you've heard from maybe some neighboring states in their uh, state association? Well, it's, it's, it's funny because of the uh, success factor, because the very first proposal we put on four years ago had a success factor, and it didn't pass. And uh, too many of our schools, at least at that point in time, believed that a success factor was a punishment for being good. And so I, I don't necessarily think that that's what the success factor is, but we removed it, and it's something that certainly could be in conversation later on. But I think that piece uh, is one that probably merits some conversation. There are a lot of states that use just a flat multiplier, and it's mostly a multiplier toward non-public schools. And we uh, did not want to do that. We wanted that whatever we were going to do for competitive balance, we wanted to do the same thing for the public schools as we were doing for the non-public schools. And we just thought that that was the, the fairest because with open enrollment, many of your public schools are having sure. students come in from outside. And so when the open enrollment piece uh, was added uh, for us, it was like, okay, we believe that for the most part, we're carrying, this is, this is the non-public part and this is the public part and they're very similar. Here we are on the cusp of, uh, you know, determining the numbers as it were for fall sports. Um, what's some of the feedback you're receiving just from superintendents, ADs? I mean, this, this past, as we mentioned earlier, a couple of years ago. So uh, what are you hearing from well, the, the it, members? It, last summer, they were a little upset because it didn't get started. <laughs> Yes, indeed, and, I've yes, heard that. Yeah, I'm sure that, you, <laughs> that you've heard that too. But I think uh, Keenan's point about, you know, to make sure that you did it right versus it had to be done at this point in time sure. was for us, it was advantageous to take the time that many of our uh, cities that were working on trying to make sure that they were counting this the right way or that the right way, that we gave them time to make sure that the information that they were submitting was going to be correct. It was much, much better for us to take the time to get it right and to give them the opportunity to have the training so that when they have to do it the next time, they know exactly what to do. Because the next time will be the, probably the same. The time after that, depending on what happens with the referendum and, and people's feeling about whether it does enough, whether it does too much, uh, there's, uh, there's always going to be consequences that no one ever sees. You know, you think that you anticipated it all, but you know you didn't. Right. And so there's always going to be things that you had that when they come up, you just have to have a willingness to say, okay, how are we going to deal with that? How close was Ohio to a split between public and private? At the at the very beginning, when right. when actually we were we were having conversations about this before the big push came to split, because we were hearing so much rumbling out there from schools, uh, and I call it water cooler talk that on Monday morning, on Monday morning, there's a lot of conversation about 
the, the team they played Saturday night and where they got their players and that player lives next door to the quarterback and he's now playing over here sure. and that kind of a piece and, and uh, much of that was getting quite vocal. Sure. And so as that momentum started with uh, the group uh, in, in the group in Northwest Ohio or in Northern, Northeastern Ohio that started that, they're good people. They're good people. They were just concerned about the equitable nature of how the tournaments were being uh, put together and teams were being put together and so they met well. Uh, did they have a following? Yes, they had a following. I went up as soon as I found out and sat down with them. <laughs> it's kind of like Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, but, <laughs> of course. But it, but it, went, but it went very well and, and when we put the, finally put the committee together we had people from that group on the committee. We had non-public people on the committee, public school, large school, rural schools, inner city schools, uh, and it was, a, it was a wonderful mix, but let me tell you, the very first meeting was a little difficult because you're putting all those people in the, in the room and across the table from each other that uh, some of them, I'm not sure, liked the other ones really, really well and probably had been the topic of conversation around the water cooler. Sure. And now you're across the table and you got to look at that person, uh, but I think you'd be really, really proud that when they finish their work, uh, we ask them to drop the baggage outside the door when they come in and let's make decisions that are going to be the best decisions for all of the kids in Ohio. When they came in at the end, I don't think you would have been able to tell who was who, mm -hmm. whether they were public, non-public. They did what they thought was the best thing for the kids in Ohio, and I'm, and I'm really, really proud of that group. Well, it sounds like you were more like Daniel the Lion Tamer, I guess, in some of those <laughs> meetings there. Let me ask you this. Some of the criticism we are hearing down in Cincinnati is the impact that it won't have on some of the Division I programs here, specifically some of the GCL South programs, Sanex, the Mullers of the world. What do you say to those who are concerned competitive balance doesn't impact those large Division I programs, how they obtain their students? Well, I, I would say that there's a lot of credibility in that piece. Uh, when we started working on the issue with Division I, it was predominantly uh, the, to divide the division because the lower half of Division I didn't feel like they adequately could compete against the top level. You know, when we had, for an example, we had uh, uh, St. X against Maslin in one of our state finals. Sure. And St. X would have been in the, the top few enrollment wise. And Maslin was the bottom school. And 2005. Think, yes. Yeah. And I think St. X had dressed more kids uh, that were juniors and seniors than Maslin had on the their team and, and sitting up in the stands. And so the original piece to help deal with Division I was to say, okay, pull that top 72 out because they're in a kind of a league of their own, and then we'll divide, make the division from there. For a while, for that issue, there were people that were really pleased. Loveland, Anderson, both made it to, sure. because they were in that bottom end of one, but they put in two where they always felt like they could compete, uh, and they did very, very well. Uh, with the competitive balance piece, I think they have a legitimate issue. We have, uh, we've had a lot of conversation about just exactly how do you do the division one piece, because they're all, there's no top and there's no ceiling with it. All the other divisions have, have a, a ceiling. ceiling. And so when, with no ceiling on the top of there, uh, we, that's probably one we're going to continue to have more conversation. I think that criticism is legitimate. I think it's legitimate because we haven't found the answer for that, but we're certainly going to listen to that. I, never, I know you never want the focus to be on you, but I know obviously you're coming back to work. You have been back to work after a series of health setbacks. But how important, many people have said that competitive balance is part of your legacy as OHSA commissioner. How important is this? that you want to see this through and, and, and succeed in the long run? Well, I think people's legacy are tied around, my, I hope my legacy is that I love and care about kids. I don't think it should be about anything anybody does. Now, I, sure. there are other people that may not agree with that, but I think you try to do what you can do to, for kids. The competitive balance for me, piece for me is very important because I've been in public schools and non-public schools. Uh, I think when the, the first time that they had the vote to split. There was a vote to split in the 70s. I was the high school principal. And in the second time they had a vote to split, I was a school superintendent. I voted against it both times because I believe that we probably have one of the best systems in the country 
we, our tournaments are looked at across the country as being some of the absolute very best. We have schools that are public and non-public that are playing all year and then to turn around and say, okay, when you get to the tournaments, they, we don't want them to play together. I guess what we would rather say, let's keep everybody in the sandbox and let's try to make sure that the rules for playing in the sandbox are maybe much more fair than what many of our schools felt like they were. I'd love to take credit for that. I can't, but one of our ADs said, I don't, you know, if you're going to make modifications for how they, they get their kids, I don't mind playing them at all. But I want to make sure when I'm on the sidelines, I look across the sidelines and I know they got their kids the same way that I did. And if they did not, then there was a modification in how they got their kids and then we'll play them every day. And I, and I think with that kind of a piece is we're starting with the competitive balance piece that way. Uh, we know that uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have some shift at the beginning. And I thought your, your comment was, how much? I don't know. I think there's going to be some, and, and it may be, there could also be unintended consequences. There may be some movement in some areas that we never, ever dreamed of. And, that's, and, if, and if that happens, then if it's positive, then that would, okay, we didn't really anticipate it, but it occurred. But if it's detrimental to a class of schools or a group of schools, then that's something that we know we need to take a good hard look at. Well, Dr. Ross, I mean, obviously a lot of layers to unwrap when it comes to this issue. Thank you very much for joining us here and, and helping us kind of get a, a really good, clear kind of look on how we're going to address things in Division One and all the different sports around the Tri-State. Well, I thank you, and thank you for what you're doing with this because as an educational piece for the area, I think it's extremely important. High school sports in Cincinnati is very, very important. In Ohio, it's very, very oh, yeah. important. But here, it's... Uh, it's a very, very important part of what happens, and you have some great schools here that have carried that flag for high school sports in Ohio. So thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time to do what you do. Well, thank thank you. you very much. So for Dr. Ross, the commissioner of the OHSAA since 2004, and for Mike Dyer, I'm Keenan Singleton. We'll, we'll continue to look at this issue as we uh, go along here.